Have you ever thought about the impact children can have in your church as a catalyst for evangelism and discipleship? In this episode of the Church Help Desk, Cindy Leach, minister to children at the Mount Church in Keller, Texas, will equip you on ways to mobilize children and their families to go out and make disciples. But um, as Emily said, I am a children's minister just like you. The Mount Church is in Keller, Texas. It's a suburb of Fort Worth. And um, I'm responsible for birth through sixth grade. Raise your hand if you're with me. All those ages, you are the one. Birth through sixth grade. Y'all, it is hard. Preschool is so needy. <laughs> they need so many people and so much stuff and it takes so much time um, but it is so worth it and I love what I do and what the Lord has called me to um, I just so you can get to know me a little bit more um, I have been a children's minister now for 24 years. Um, my first ministry position when I was hired, it was an interim position, and I was eight months pregnant with my second child. That's how I track how long it's been, because she is 24. And so um, I don't know what they were thinking. I didn't know anything. I was completely clueless about ministry, but I loved kids, and I loved Jesus, and so I'm like, let's go. And through that experience, that's when the Lord just really placed a call in my life that this is what I've equipped you to do. So um, I had gotten married and dropped out of school because, you know, somebody had to pay bills and then we had babies. And so that's when I went back to school, uh, got my degree in ministry and have been serving in children's ministry in some form or fashion ever since. So I'm married to Jason. My husband, Jason, is an elementary school PE teacher. That is the best, y'all. My recreation is always taken care of. <laughs> so great. I can borrow all kinds of equipment for whatever wacky idea comes into my mind. So if you're not married to a PE teacher, try to find one somewhere because it's a really great resource, really great resource to have. Um, he'll say, oh, hey, we played this game, or I, he'll show me something on his uh, network from elementary PE, and it just fits right in with what we do. So we're with kids all the time. Uh, we no longer have kids in our home. We have two daughters, um, our 24-year-old I told you about. She is married to Chandler, and I'm seeing these Chick-fil-A boxes. It makes me so happy. They are on the trajectory to own their own Chick-fil-A. So that is their goal. So they're moving to open a new Chick-fil-A in Anna, Texas, and are on a three-year plan to own their own. So y'all eat more Chick-fil-A, eat more chicken, and support my family. That makes me real happy. The, um, and then my older daughter, Melissa, she is 26, and she's getting married in March. So y'all pray for us. Y'all, the florist canceled. All the wedding things are stressful, but it's so good. It is so, so good. But it's, uh, she is happy, and we're delighted with our two girls. Um, so in addition to just my regular church ministry, I did serve in an organization called Kids Beach Club. If you're not familiar with Kids Beach Club, it is is, well, if you are, give them a good shout out. Um, it's an evangelism organization that partners churches with elementary schools to go into those schools and do Bible clubs on school campuses. So it's a great ministry. I highly recommend it um, to get your church outside the walls. So I have a big heart for evangelism. So leaving Kids Beach Club to go back into local church was just, I never expected that. I never thought the Lord would lead me to do that. But he made it clear that the Mount Church is where I'm to serve. So let me tell you a little bit about the Mount. Well, before that, just so you know, my experience is primarily with traditional First Baptist Church type churches. It may not have had the name First Baptist Church, but it could have, you know, very similar, very cookie cutter, very this is what we do. The Mount Church is completely different. It is a, um, a relaunch of a dying church. So the relaunch start was 10 years ago, and they were in need of leadership to help them build new programs. Programming and to really lay a good foundation for uh, all of their programming, but preschool children's ministry. And I just felt this call to let's go be part of this team building something new. So it's a young church, and um, so it's exciting um, to be part of something that is growing and vibrant and fun, but it is stressful. So, um, as you know, there's a lot to do. Uh, the to-do list is long. And so I asked you guys to put up these sticky notes here, and um, we are going to talk about that in just a second. 
So here are the things that take up your time as a children's ministry leader. I kind of read them a few minutes ago. Most of them are involved with planning and preparing. Raise your hand if your note had something about planning and preparing. Something said gather supplies, uh, prepping for Sunday, um, enlisting volunteers, preparing curriculum. I saw a lot of scheduling volunteers, like our volunteers rotate, and that's, that's a huge responsibility to get everybody on the schedule. Over here I saw one that just said child care. <laughs> Can you relate? That's what I think. Oh, man, every event for the church, there's something that kids, that needs to happen for kids, and that's something else that we need to do. Uh, this was my favorite right here. It said, meetings and dealing with small issues that don't really matter or shouldn't really matter. Who wrote that? Who wrote, oh, man. I don't know if I can throw that far. I'm going to send you these M&Ms, okay? Are you ready? If I hit you ladies in the head, I am so sorry. I am not an athlete. Are you ready? Oh! I tried. I tried. But isn't that true? We get so bogged down with all the things that really don't matter. And in fact, I have um, an app on my phone that I use to keep track of my tasks. And this, when I read that, I looked it up to make sure I had this quote right. I have a quote that I keep as the top task in my tasks, and it's from John Maxwell, and it says this, you cannot overestimate the unimportance of practically everything. Did you catch that? You cannot overestimate the unimportance of practically everything. How often do we get bogged down with the things that really aren't that important, or they're not as important as we think that they are. And so those are the things, for whatever reason, that get our attention and take our time, and they need to be done, and they're part of our responsibility, but they take our focus off the main thing. Now, none of you put on your sticky notes that you're the thing that you spend the most of your time on is anchoring kids and families in the Great Commission. How is it that we spend time on these little details that are important and have value, but we lose focus on the main thing? So today, what I'm hoping that we can do is just refocus our thoughts on the main things that keep uh, the purpose behind the ministry that we do. And uh, so that's what we're going to talk about. So I hope that it's an encouragement to you and a challenge to you. This is going to be super interactive. So I've already talked to you more than I want to be talking to you because I want you to have a chance to talk to each other and for us to share together. So I'm hopeful today that you'll walk away with a renewed vision of your purpose in ministry and what we do, and that you'll leave with some really great ideas that you can implement right away in your ministries, and you can discern, the third thing would be to discern, what do you need to say no to in order to say yes to what's most important? So are you ready to hit it? All right, let's do it. Let's do it. So there's a handout on your sheet that looks like this, and it's just for note taking. This is not something that you'll like frame and go back to forever, but we are going to focus on the Great Commission, and we're going to use the Great Commission to bring out some reminders of what we need to be about in preschool and children's ministry. So let me read this to you. So, and Jesus came and same to, said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I don't think that's printed on your list, so don't panic. <laughs> go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. To the end of the age. So here's the question for you to think about and uh, talk around your tables. Oh no, do this for me. On a scale of one to ten, one being low, ten being high, okay? How closely does your kids' ministry live out the Great Commission? So looking at this, making disciples, baptizing them, teaching them, how closely? So scale of 1 to 10, just hold up your fingers, 1 being not very well, we're distracted by a lot of other things, 10 being, man, we are on it, we are great commission, 100%. Just hold up your hands and let us know. Let's just have a little, little confession. This is, this is my church here. This is us. Yeah. I'm giving myself a 7 
for just how well our church is doing. Um, and a lot of that is we're a young church. You know, I'm still writing children's ministry policies for our church. So there are a lot of things that we have yet to implement to lay the foundation so we can make sure that those things are taken care of and we're about the Great Commission. But I think that we need to be on the way that, again, these other things that are less important don't overshadow this most important uh, command from Jesus to be about the Great Commission. So let's break it down. So we're going to start here with the box on the cross. And you guys, let me just say, okay, here's a disclaimer for you. I am not a linear thinker. I'm a fast talker. My brain goes kind of like this. So we are not going to go through the Great Commission in linear order. And I'm real sorry for you guys who need to have that in order and you want your timeline and your chart. We're not going to go that way. And I'm real sorry, but it's going to be okay. We're going to get to all of it. But we're going to start in the middle with this phrase. Um, you know, I'm, I'm underlining make disciples because we know that's the core of the Great Commission, right? That's the, the um, command from Jesus is to make disciples as we go, to make disciples. So one way we make disciples is we talk about baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And what does, uh, what is baptism um, a response to? This is time for you to talk. Why are, why are people baptized? after salvation, right? So we're going to use this phrase baptizing to help us think through if we're baptizing kids, kids and families, then they've heard the gospel and they've responded to Jesus, right? So we're going to talk about weaving the gospel into your kids ministry. So here is a question for you to talk about around your tables. How do you weave the gospel into your kids ministry? Let's take about four minutes or so. Talk about that Share what your church is doing in weaving the gospel into your kids' ministry. On your mark, get set, go. So who in your group, not you, but someone at your table share, like someone share if when someone else at your table had a really out-of-the-box idea that you thought, this is awesome, I never thought about that before. Somebody have something like that that you can share that you heard someone else at your table talk about? Don't be shy. I can wait you out. I'm a certified biblical counselor. I know how to listen and just wait for you to talk. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. Oh, I like it. I like the imagery of a stone marker. I didn't connect that until you said it. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> I like it. I like it. What other uh, creative ideas on weaving the gospel into your ministry? I'm sure there were others. You were talking a lot. Maybe... No? No? A great idea. In her Awana time, they have intentional gospel talks throughout the year with the different age groups. Okay. And I, feel, I told her, I was like, oh, we're missing that. We focus so much on the missions aspect in our large group. That, so we're gonna gotcha. So I'm curious about that. You said intentional gospel talks with each age group. So is that like one-on-one -on -one with each child or just as each age group yeah, has a time slot or a date for that yeah, or whatever? Yes, yeah, separate age groups. And we cool. That's great. Times. That's so great. I love that. Um, the thing, um, the book that helped me most in the area of the gospel is Gospel Centered Kids. Do y'all have copies of this one? Because it's a good one. It's relatively new. It's new-ish, maybe four or five years old. But um, it's been really helpful. And you can see I have flagged some pages um, because this year we have not used this for volunteer training yet at our church. So February 8th is our volunteer training. It's next Saturday. And so um, these are the pages that I've flagged that I want to remember to talk to them about. We're giving all our leaders copies because we want them to understand that the gospel is not just something, a presentation you tack on to the end 
of a Bible story. It weaves through everything that we do and everything that we talk about um, with kids. So just as much as you're planning when you have an event or even just your regular Sundays, with the same time and effort that we plan um, how we're going to decorate and how uh, we're going to, who's going to serve where and what kind of food are we going to eat, we need to spend the same amount of time thinking how are we going to really weave the gospel into what we knew, do, not just we're going to tack on this gospel presentation at the end, or but to think through the different elements of the gospel. You may not cover the whole gospel message in every Sunday, but you can make sure that you spend time talking about sin and another week talking about repentance. And over time, those layers are going to build and your kids are going to walk away understanding the truth of the gospel. So some things to keep in mind when you're weaving in the gospel. Uh, the curriculum that you choose is important in weaving in the gospel. Y'all, there's a lot of stuff out there on the internet that is free. But that doesn't mean it's good just because it's free, and it probably is not. So it might be that you need to adjust your budget to choose a curriculum that really is going to um, clearly speak the gospel week after week. And again, not just have a Bible lesson um, um, about David and Goliath, for example, and you talk about, oh, David had courage, and David trusted God. Well, Sure, but we don't want our kids just to leave with a moralistic teaching, right? We want them to know that David is a type of Christ, and David could not defeat Goliath on his own in the same way that we can't defeat sin on our own. He needed power from God, and we need that power from Jesus, that transformed life from Jesus Christ. So your curriculum is so important. What are you teaching kids when they're with you? Consistency is important as well to make sure every time kids are at church, I want them to have some sort of a Jesus experience. Even if that means that their parents are in a meeting and we've got a coloring sheet, we want that to be something that's going to be Jesus-centered. So from the toys in our classrooms to books that are on the shelves in our preschool rooms, we want to make sure that everything we do points to Jesus. So that was one of the first things I did at the Mount was take away all the Mickey Mouse and Disney Princess books and replace them with Jesus books. So just make sure that every time a child, everything they encounter at your church is gonna point them to Jesus in some way um, as much as you can. Um, you wanna weave in the odd gospel in all age groups. You guys, don't be afraid of weaving in the gospel with um, your little, little ones. Uh, we use the gospel project at our church. Anybody else gospel project people? Whoop, whoop. So um, some of the lessons are tough. Y'all, we're a little bit behind. And so this last Sunday was uh, Daniel's dream for us. Wow, that was tough. So um, that was a hard one. Um, and in fact, our three-year-old class, um, we are using YouTube to scroll our videos on smart TVs. I don't ask me how to do this. I have a helper who helps me do this, but that's how we're doing it. Anyway, they accidentally selected the wrong video. And so they're playing. So on the week of Daniel and the lion's den, they played Daniel's dream and the beasts and all the stuff. And one of the three-year-olds said, man, that's scary. And so the teacher's like, ah, you know, so the week ahead of time, she's like, do we need to, should we skip this story? I don't know. It's kind of scary. And that was a chance for me as a leader to say no. All of scripture is important. And so we're going to have, you know, we're going to talk about how Daniel pointed to the Son of God as the ruler um, that will reign forever. Um, but what we did, this is just a free thing. Um, I knew this was coming. So we promoted a pajama day since Daniel had a dream. So last Sunday was pajamas days and the kids wore their pajamas on Sunday morning. Y'all, I thought I was going to get fired, but I did not. It all worked out just fine. Um, but I did Monday. I'm like, was that a distraction? Do I need to not do stuff like that again? Um, and they said, no, it was fine. <laughs> and, um, but I did have uh, one little boy just said, this is just free. This wasn't, this, I'm off script. One little boy said, um, uh, he was in his regular church clothes. And he said, uh, my mom didn't want me to wear pajamas to church today. And I was, that was my opportunity to say, you know, we obey our parents more than we do. And you know, that is so important for you to obey. So we are so glad you're here. And it is okay that you're not in pajamas because you obeyed your mom. And that's a good teaching as well. So anyway, um, but yeah, we want to do that in all age groups. So don't shy away from some of those hard biblical concepts. Just as simply and as accurately as possible, we want to teach the truth of the gospel. And then take advantage of those milestones. Um, I put baptism as an example because that's a, you know, a child makes a decision 
decision for Christ, and typically they're baptized, you know, shortly after that. Um, but think about other milestones, um, like we do a first grade Bible presentation. Um, so all of our first graders, they're learning to read. We want them to read God's Word. So that is a great opportunity, those milestones in families to really encourage parents to be about um, uh, teaching their kids at home as well. So other thoughts about uh, weaving in the gospel in what you do. This is kind of children's ministry 101, but it's foundational and important, and I don't want to skip over it to get to the um, more in-depth idea share. Um, what other things about weaving in the gospel? All right, well, in your box, I hope you jotted down some ideas or some thoughts or reminders about weaving in the gospel in your churches. So we will move to the next concept in the Great Commission, which we're going to jump down to the end on this one, and uh, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. You'll see I included a picture of a family, because who are the primary disciplers in the lives of children? Parents, exactly, parents. So here's the question. Here's the question for you. How are you coaching families toward evangelism in their homes? Basically having those gospel conversations at home. So take a few minutes and talk around your tables with this question. How are you coaching families toward evangelism in their homes? All right, we're going to share a little bit differently this time because the last time was kind of a dud. You guys looking at me. So we're going to have, we have four rows of tables here, okay? So I want to hear just kind of what your conversation centered around um, just from at least one person in each group, okay? So let's start on this side. Somebody on this side just kind of share what, what the conversation centered around for your table in the area of coaching families toward evangelism at home. Yeah. It's like kind of basic, but giving them the content that they could go learning. Yes. Like, don't, or, I don't know, expecting their kids to communicate. So I think that was something our kids kind of talked about, like each person sharing like their experience. Yeah. To give that to parents. And I think, yes, and I think with that, to um, more than just. Um, uh, a piece of paper at home because I don't know about you guys but I get so discouraged when I whatever I sent home with kids you see it on the ground in the hallway before they go <laughs> I had a volunteer say once maybe you know like kids do a craft and you know it's not something that they're going to keep forever but you hope that it'll at least make it kind of in the car but I had a parent once joke and say can you put some bins right here by the door so we can just go ahead and throw away the crafts now so they don't uh, you know make it to my car and I'm like oh that kills me you know they're not going to keep but you do want parents to have those conversations so think beyond just a take-home paper that day you know what can you do with social media to encourage your parents toward the next week or what recap what they learned. Um, what can you provide um, access to? I know if you use a LifeWay um, product, whether it's Bible Studies for Life or um, the Gospel Project or um, the new one, anyone? Emily, what's that called? The one, the Bible book one? The Explore the Bible? Is it Explore the Bible? Did I win? I'll give myself a piece of candy, I guess, maybe. The, um, but yeah, whether you use any of those, on their app, there's a family app that you can uh, give access to for your churches, and it's 99 cents a quarter for your families, so they can have that on their phones and um, have those conversations at home. It's just telling them that we have those things. Okay, so this group here, what's something else that you guys talked about in the way of evangelism or encouraging your coaching families toward evangelism and gospel conversations at home? Okay. Awesome. So parenting conferences just about like talking with your kids about the gospel. Fantastic. How often do you do that? Right now we've only done it twice in the past two or three years. Okay, great. So is it a one time thing or like a class that builds? It's a one time thing. I love it. We try to have it once a year. So. Okay. Have you found a success? Look at me. I'm just grilling you. I'm so sorry because I'm curious. Have you found a successful time slot for that? No. Oh, like on a Sunday morning? Yeah, we did this on a Saturday. Oh, on a Saturday. And Perfect. You have to provide child care. Yeah, you have to provide child care. I'm telling you. Yeah, yeah. Because um, a lot of people just can't come. 
Um, they just can't um, without child care. So awesome. That's great. So this row here, what was something that you guys talked about or an idea on uh, helping coach families toward the gospel? One of the things we talked about was really trying to explain the why. Okay. Because just, you know, we stay home calendars of like, hey, this is stuff you can do. We stay home sheets about the curriculum mm -hmm. and stuff, but they just needed one more thing to do. Right. Like they don't Yeah. How we're trying to help their kids grow and be productive. The, the eternal significance of those conversations versus soccer practice. And that's hard because we're, that's the culture where we are too. We're an affluent suburb and our families are on the go and they are involved in lots of different activities. And so it's hard for them to see the value, the long-term value of short-term investments with their kids um, evangelistically and talking about the gospel and faith. So that's a good reminder. That's a very, very good reminder. And you don't know what's going to stick. So I want to affirm you in just continuing to try different things because what works for one family, something different might work for another. So don't be afraid to share, afraid to share resources, give out books, remind, encourage. I feel like that's a large part of what we do, that the time, the tasks take that time away from thinking, how can we be intentionally involving parents? So we're doing this thing for kids. What am I going to give to a parent? What am I going to say to a parent? How am I going to encourage a parent instead of just they drop off and leave? What are they going to leave with to be able to have gospel conversations at home. So that's a good word. Okay, this side over here. You have plenty of time to think. Whoa, but the hand in the back. We, we had a lot of good going on right here, but I told them one thing that I started um, this past month is social media. Yeah. On our private page, I'm coming up mm -hmm. and telling them what we're going to be learning Sunday, yep. what questions there are mm -hmm. going to be, and it's awesome because you know Facebook, all of a sudden you see who's watching yes. and what's going on. Another thing that I didn't get to share with you guys at this table is we sit out a devotion on Sunday nights for four days. Mm -hmm. And the kids are supposed to say, uh, do those devotions with their parents. Their parents sign that devotion, each devotion, put it back in the folder and it comes back. That tallies for mission bucks. So at the end of the year, the kid can walk in and buy something for another kid in another country. Oh, that's great. That's great. We're going to come back to that on our third topic. Because I'm curious about your mission bucks. That sounds cool. The, um, so casting an evangelistic uh, vision to parents um, to emphasize the importance of evangelism at home. And again, it's not just a, a one-time conversation. It's not like talking with your kids about the birds and the bees. You know, it's like we're going to have this super awkward conversation. And I hope I only have to have it one time because it's super awkward. We don't want spiritual conversations to feel like that. And we don't want those conversations to feel like that either. But that is a different conference. But anyway, the, um, we want parents to weave the gospel into their natural patterns of life at home. Um, and that is an important way to do that. So just emphasizing, like you said back here in the back, just telling them why it's important. Um, involving your pastor to help when he has opportunity to encourage parents to be about spiritual conversations, to share illustrations in his sermons that are friendly for the home for those families who do have kids at home uh, to help them remember to have that um, gospel mindset as they go. Um, I don't know what it is about families, but at Advent, our families, man, they are all in. I'm seeing Facebook posts on this is what our family's doing for Advent. I think it's the short term mindset of, you know, this is four weeks and we're going to, you know, talk about the birth of Jesus. There's a, a, an end point. There's a direction to it. So potentially our families need something like that. Just that um, thought on, okay, for the next month, this is what we want our families to be doing. And just give that kind of short-term concept. And that might build some long-term habits to start, to start um, short term, especially for those, those families who have no idea where to start or what to do. Um, so another thing is to provide opportunities for families to be on mission together. So that can mean just involving families. This is not just a parent to have a faith conversation with a child, but to involve kids in evangelism as well. So how are families being about the gospel as they go as a family? So some ideas of things that you might uh, think about would be like a family mission trip. Um, this one day that you guys are doing as a state would be a great thing for a family to do together. Um, our church, uh, we have a prayer team 
And before our VBS last summer, again, I've only been at my church two years, so I don't have time to do all these things. But our prayer team said, hey, we'd like to do a prayer walk for VBS. And I said, well, what if we make it a family prayer walk and have our families come up and pray around the campus together? Y'all, our prayer team knocked it out of the park. They color-coded everything. There was a list of where to pray for. There was a map. And so the kids could go and match the colors and get to the location, and then their family would pray together. And it just was a tremendous way to see families, again, thinking about, you know, the gospel and sharing the gospel with the lost through VBS. Um, so I have some really great families who um, at VBS, we cast the vision for uh, families to fill up their car, to have a kid in every seat of your car come into VBS, invite that many people so your car is full when you come. And we have some families who have continued that. So I have two families in particular who on uh, Wednesday nights, they fill up their car and bring all the kids. There's one family who the kids meet at the church, like the parents drop off, and then these parents just take everybody home, uh, which is a great way to do that. But the family I'm thinking of, um, it's the Moore family, if you know them in Keller, Texas, but they, um, mom will just fill up her suburban with kids. Well, one week her seatbelt was, one of the seatbelts in their car was broken. And so they had to, they couldn't fit everybody and they have three children on their own. They couldn't fit everybody. So they had to take two cars. So mom and dad drove separate cars to church that day. And her kid's response was, so can we invite more friends because we have more seats? And the parents were like, yeah, we can. So they filled up two cars of kids. That was two weeks ago, so I'll let you know if that sticks. But um, just that very simple thought to families and kids, fill up your car and who can you bring with you to church? The, um, and again, making those connections between what happens at church and what happens at home. Um, the idea of just sharing simply what you're learning at church with your parents is a great way to make that connection. And then providing resources and support for them. Um, just providing those resources and support. So here's a question for you. So we want to be about um, helping families, parents. We know parents are the primary disciplers of their kids. Um, but what about kids whose parents aren't believers? What about those kids? So to me, they become that those parents become that child's mission field in, in a sense that we want to help those kids be equipped to have faith conversations with their parents. It's kind of a reverse discipleship. Um, when I worked for Kids Beach Club, it is, you know, an organization where we send church volunteers into schools to teach the Bible. Well, many children that was their only opportunity to hear about Jesus. Their parents aren't going to take them to church, but they'll let them stay after an extra hour after school on a Tuesday in the library to go to a Bible club. They're okay with that. So um, with that, we uh, would provide Bibles for all the kids and those Bibles would get home. So it's a so I would, an idea for you would be for if you have kids who they come to church and their parents are unchurched or maybe you have a bus ministry or something like that. Um, what we found is those kid friendly Bibles in the homes, parents will pick up and read, not a children's storybook Bible, that's not what I'm talking about, but a colorful Bible with good illustrations and good um, study helps a parent will pick that up and read it. So just keep that in mind that as you have those kids, what can you get into the homes where those kids can help answer their parents' questions about faith? So just something to think about. Um, anything else on evangelism, parents talking to kids about faith, parents involving their kids in gospel opportunities? Any other thoughts or suggestions? All right. Well, we will move right along. Then to, this is where I'm out of order, y'all. Sorry. <laughs> so with the Great Commission, let's focus on the phrase, make disciples of all nations. Make the disciples of all nations. So this, I want us to think about how can we help our kids and our families. It's so easy to get focused on our own personal lives, to just lift up their eyes and see that there's a world beyond self beyond our family, just to lift up their eyes, to see the needs of other people, to see the nations. So here's the discussion question for your group. How well is your kids' ministry getting outside the walls of your church? 
And when I typed this on this slide, this is the conviction that the Lord gave to me, is how well are you, Cindy, getting outside the walls of your church? And I have to confess, because of all this sticky note stuff, not very well. Not very well. So that was convicting to me as a children's minister. So rank your ministry here. How well is your kid's ministry getting outside the walls of your church? So hold up your, your, your hand. Um, how well is your kid's ministry at getting outside the walls of your church? This is not you personally. That was just for you to think about. But um, how well is your kid's ministry getting outside the walls? Here's, what do you think? Here's where I kind of am. You, you, I see a one back there. I'm a, probably a five. I see a four. So it's hard. It's hard, isn't it? to get outside the walls and to think about that. So um, this is an area where I feel like we really do. The, those Sundays y'all keep coming every week. There's another Sunday and we have to be ready and we have to be prepared. And that can take our focus that we miss some of the big picture things that we need to do. So here's for your group discussion, this question. What opportunities are you giving kids to pray for missions, to give to missions, or to go. And that could be, you know, here, near, and far. It does, we're not talking just about, you know, China and far away. It could just be across the street. So what opportunities are you giving kids to pray and to give and to go? You guys discuss. All right, let's come back and start sharing some of those great ideas in the way of praying, giving, and going. Um, so let's start with somebody on one of those four tables in the back. What was something that your table talked about um, as an idea for involving kids in praying, giving, or going? Okay. We took everything inside and outside. We took the van, we took the table, we took the chairs. We set up booths, how to pray for you, and we get involved with children, youth, local missions, whatever. Um, and then our children, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, are doing this as well. Um, more tied to range with those because they're little kids. Uh, you can see the teenagers out a little far from that. But, um, they're really involved with that. They're really encouraging each other to do that. That's great. I love that. I love that. And I love the whole church being involved um, and the kids part of what the church is doing, not separately. Um, our kids are over here doing this missions thing that doesn't fit in with the big picture of what the church is doing. I love that. So anybody else in the back have something you want to share? About praying, giving, or going? All right. What about you guys in the middle? What, was your, what did your discussion center around, around your tables? That's great. Do you do that through um, an organization or you on your own? Awesome. Awesome to load them up, load up your preteens and take them on a mission trip. That's great. That's very cool. So what other thoughts, middle? Middle, you're not the middle children. The middles. What other conversations did you guys have about praying, giving, or going? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So the kids brought ingredients for a birthday party kit and that were given away. That's cool. Love it. All right. Front row. Front row. What um, <laughs> did your conversation center around, around praying, giving, or going? One thing we do, and it's, it's depends on the summer how we do it, but we do something called summer of service. And we've done it as a one-week service camp. And we'll do something within our church to serve the people in our church, something in our community, and then we'll try to do something, I think one year we made stuff for shoeboxes. Right. To kind of do, you know, you know, something. And then we've done it on Wednesdays in the summer as well, depending on the place of the summer. And we would go into the food pantry and work one week, and we would go into the nursing home and make stuff and take care. 
That's great. I love that. I love that. The, um, there's really no end of ways that you can involve kids in service projects or in collecting something. Um, the caution with, uh, with that I try to make with our kids is make sure that the act of service is connected to the gospel. So we want kids that are socially minded and have a heart for others, but we don't want them to lose that we serve others because of what Jesus has done for us. Um, yes, we serve others because it's the right thing to do. You know, we're not a works-based. Um, that's not what we believe. Um, and so we serve as a response to what Jesus has done for us to, to make sure that's clear when you involve the kids in the act of service or the ministry project. Why are we doing this? What's the purpose behind this? What has God given to us? So we're going to give to others um, those kinds of things. Um, so involving them in, uh, you know, praying for the lost, uh, praying for missionaries. If there are missionaries that your church directly supports, um, you know, that's a great uh, way to emphasize that. We have a world map on the wall in our children's area and the minister, the missionaries that are directly connected to people in our church or that we directly support, those people are mapped on our world map. So the kids can see them and we can stop and pray for them as we go along. Um, but praying for the lost, especially to help them identify people in their circles of influence who don't know Jesus and help them to understand the gospel enough that they can share it, but also the importance and the value of praying for them, that there's power in prayer and God answers prayer. Um, I feel like sometimes it's true, you know, how can they hear, how can they believe without someone telling them, you know, how can they hear without a preacher? We don't want to put undue pressure on a child to think it's up to me for this person to get saved. You know, I'm the only one who can um, share the gospel with that person. We don't want them to feel that pressure. It's the Holy Spirit is the one that will draw them and will save them. We're messengers. And so we can do that by simply telling and by praying. But we want to encourage kids, of course, to pray for the lost and to speak the truth of the gospel, but not with so much um, zeal and fervor that they misunderstand and feel an unnecessary sense of responsibility for that person to get saved, you know? We want it to be a healthy level of conviction. Um, with giving, um, with giving, um, you know, I, your church, I'm guessing as a Southern Baptist church, you support the cooperative program. Your kids should know that. They should understand what their money goes to. What does their church, it's, you know, within their church and outside of their church, what does their giving support? And then give them opportunities to give. Um, now, here's just some fun giving things that I've done that you can take or leave. One of them um, uh, was uh, called the Quarter Mile. And so we gave all the kids a yardstick and the goal was for each kid to fill their yardstick with quarter laid flat. It's just under an inch long. Okay. So you lay the quarters flat on the yardstick. You bring your yardstick back. We lay them around the halls of the church. And the goal was to have a quarter mile of quarters like measured laying flat. So fun. So visual. Those quarters were attached to those yardsticks in so many crazy ways. It was maybe the worst thing I've ever had to do is remove quarters from yardsticks, just so you know. So think that through. Yeah, I mean, super glue, duct tape, um, yeah, just um, like hot glue, all the things to attach the quarters. So a wonderful idea, super visual. I loved it. It was effective. Our kids loved it. Have a team ready to remove quarters from yardsticks should you choose to do that. I did not. <laughs> anyway, so that was kind of fun. We've done some other things with, um, you know, um, a pyramid of canned goods or, uh, you know, whatever is a visual to help them see um, what their donation is going to and will help is always helpful. And then with going, uh, you know, you want your kids to have as many opportunities as possible um, that are um, age appropriate for them. So, um, you know, if your church is having a mission trip, who knows? I mean, if families can go on that trip, our church is taking a trip to Zimbabwe and one of our fourth graders is going to go with her parents to Zimbabwe um, at the end of February. So that's, you know, that family's decision. But our church didn't say, no, you know, we're not going to take kids with us to Zimbabwe. They're like, you know, your parents are there and if your parents want you to go, let's go. So she is participating with all the team meetings, all of the preparation. She is part of the team and that's exciting to see kids involved in that way with their families. Um, our um, uh, city does a parade at Christmas 
And so our preteens, our fifth and sixth graders, they put together a parade float the last two years. And this year, um, it was the only Jesus themed Christmas float in the whole parade. Well, y'all, that's evangelism for kids. Um, you know, that's sharing the gospel with our city through this parade float. So think, you know, outside the box, how can we involve kids in praying, giving, and going with missions? So here, you guys, we're going to move along to our last point. This is where the rubber meets the road with that. You know, Jesus told us that we're to go and make disciples. Remember, make disciples is what we need to do. Um, but here's the thing. It's not really up to us. We've got the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So this is as leaders for us to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit to help us make decisions on what things do we need to give less attention to so we can give more attention on the things that are going to really last and matter. Um, what events do we need to add? How can we get our kids on mission? The Lord, the Holy Spirit, you have the gift of the Holy Spirit to help you discern and to know and to lead your ministry well. Um, your kids have the Holy Spirit in them, right? To be on mission with the gospel. So here are some biblical examples to think about. Um, Peter, right? He um, had the Holy Spirit's power and he was called to preach, right? Some of your kids could be called to preach someday. Look at Philip. He was trained to explain the Word of God to the Ethiopian man, right? He had the Holy Spirit's power to help him do that. Your kids have the Holy Spirit's power and you have the Holy Spirit's power to help us teach and explain the Scriptures well. Um, look at Stephen, right? He had the Holy Spirit's power and was bold in speaking up for Jesus. You can be bold in speaking up what, what you know is best for the kids in your ministry. You can speak up to your volunteers to make sure they are on mission with the gospel. And you can lead your kids to speak boldly for Jesus. Um, look at Paul. He traveled around the world to share the gospel with people who were not like him. So how can be, we get outside the walls and share with people who are not like us, right? How can our kids boldly go and share the gospel with people who are different than they are. Um, look at Lydia. What did she do? She opened her home and with her gift of hospitality, she um, was used the Holy Spirit's power to minister to those within her church um, there in um, her city, which I drew a blank on, but it's awesome. Y'all are going to forgive me, right? Um, so it could be that just with the gift of hospitality, your kids may open their home and invite someone over to talk with them about Jesus. Or you may open your home or open the doors of your church to those as they come in. And finally, look at Andrew. What did Andrew do? He invited his, but his brother to come hear the good news about Jesus. He asked a friend. So it could be just that simple. Who do, can your kids invite in the Holy Spirit's power to invite to, be, to learn about Jesus with them. So the Great Commission, the Great Commission, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age, to the end of the age. Amen. So here are some action steps for you to think about. Uh, there's a clock at the bottom of your handout there. Um, and I've got two questions for you to kind of think through what's an action step. Um, so number one, um, how will you adjust to make room for anchoring kids and families in the Great Commission? What do you need to say no to, to say yes to something better? How do you need to adjust your schedule during the week to make time in your schedule for what's important? So think that through and jot that down on the bottom of your paper. What's that one adjustment, just one small adjustment to anchoring kids and families in the Great Commission? And then the other thing is, what one new idea are you taking away are you to implement at your church? What's your, what's your takeaway today? What's your idea? Um, what's something you think, man, we'd like to try that? What's your one new, new idea? 
And I want to encourage you. I went to a women's event this weekend, and one of the workshop leaders did this. So I'm going to try it today. She said, get out your phone right now and set a reminder on your phone to implement the one thing. So you might write it down and then you get in your car and we get busy. So it will not offend me. If you want to take out your phone right now and set it up, put a note, set a reminder. Um, like I have an app that's a to-do list. Um, I would add a to-do to consider what's the one thing that I need to do differently. So as you continue to think about that, let me close us in prayer and we'll have just a few minutes for some Q&A here if you'd like. So, Father, I thank you that you did give us the gift of your Holy Spirit and you, um, God, in your goodness and in your graciousness, did not leave us alone to figure out um, what you desire or how to best minister to people. God, you have given us uh, yourself <laughs> inside of us. And, Lord, so we just thank you for that gift. Lord, I pray over these uh, ministers here in this room that you would just, through the power of your Holy Spirit, um, that they would feel your uh, presence with them. God, God, that they would tap in to your power. God, that you would give them discernment and wisdom on what things to give less emphasis to in order to make space to give more emphasis to those things that are most important. And God, we know that that's the command that you've given us to, to make disciples and to be about the gospel and to... Um, uh, Help people come to know you, God, to baptize them in your name, to teach them to obey you, God, to get outside the walls and to um, reach the nations with the gospel. God, you've given us this, um, just this mission field of children in our churches. God, it is a gift and we want to be good stewards of that. So Lord, I do ask that just help us to be good stewards of the children in the church that you've placed us. God, we love you and thank you that you um, are able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we could ever ask or imagine. God, for your glory, that's what we want is for the name of Jesus to be lifted high and for you to be glorified. And it's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.